This weekend on Fox and Friends, a perhaps much more important debate broke out with the White House, a former White House press secretary. It is not my guest today on The Will Cain Show. It is not Dana Perino. It was Kaylee McEnany, who was guest hosting Fox and Friends weekend. And this came up, and we realized there might be a gender divide. There might just be a huge debate in America. Do you eat in the bed? Watch. Finally, eating in bed is becoming an increasingly popular trend among young people. Gross. I, what? I, Why not? Oh, yeah. Are you serious, Kaylee? Yes. Let's get My daughter and I do it all the time. All right, we're going to get to that in a moment. <laughs> Data from a new survey shows 58% of Americans between 18 and 24 say their bed is their preferred <laughs> place to eat when they get hungry late at night, while nearly 44% of adults of all ages admit to doing the same. So we want to know, do you like to eat where you sleep? Or is snacking in the sack a no-go? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. The more colorful and descriptive, the better. Okay, here's my, first of all, never saw that one coming, Kaylee. (laughs) I didn't see this coming. (laughs) Well, I'm going to bet this is one of the places you and I are on the same side. This is no, a no-no. Big time. Yeah. Why? Why? What? This is gross. It's gross. And then and then if you do it, then your kids do it. And then there's there's stuff in your sheets. It's just uh-huh. gross. Hey, it just get up Crumbs and eat over here. In your, sh- in your sheets. My husband, Sean, agrees with you. And when he goes out of town on hunting trips, my daughter, Blake, and I, I mean, we lap it up. It we is. bring, Water. like, cake to bed, mm-hmm. ice cream, cake. and there are crumbs everywhere. <laughs> Yes, and she's four. So you can imagine how this turns out. Uh-huh. I don't even like it on the couch. All right, is this a male and female thing? Is this a former White House press secretary thing. Let's settle this debate (laughs) here in America with story number one. She is the co-anchor of America's (laughs) Newsroom, the co-host of The Five. Uh, She is also the host of Perino on Politics right here at Fox News Podcast and the author of Everything Will Be Okay. It is the former press secretary for George W. Bush, Dana Perino. Hi, how are you? Do you eat in the bed? Never. It's unacceptable. I wonder, I don't know if it's gender. I wonder if it's uh, age. I'm so much older. <laughs> I don't know. She's so young and so accomplished and uh, she has children. <laughs> so maybe that's why, but no, I don't. But my dog is on the bed. Does your dog sleep in the bed yeah. with you? I made a mistake when he was a little puppy of he had gotten sick. So I had Jasper who like he was famous dog. I loved him so much. And when he was nine, he died and it was sudden. It was shocking. It was horrible. 12, like, I think 10 weeks later, we got this new puppy, Percy. And in the first, like, two weeks we had him, he ate some mulch. I didn't know he had eaten mulch. And I found him with, like, drool, bloated belly. Like, we had to rush him to the emergency room. And thankfully, it was going through the system, and it was he was going to be okay. But it was so traumatic for me. And that night when we got home, I said to Peter, I know I'm making a huge mistake here, but I don't want to worry that he's not breathing at this tonight I want to be able to so I'm going to let him sleep in the bed and he said you know what you're doing right I said yep six months later try to kick him out of the bed did not work I mean it was the most it's a disgust he lost it being kicked out of the bed like explosive you know what like it was horrible at 4 a.m we gave in and said okay fine so now the dog's on the bed which most people might think is gross I think it's a mistake. You it is some, a mistake. You did, in the, in your story about Jasper and Percy, I think you did something, you made a mistake, but you also did something smart. So here, here's what you did smart. So I don't think you know I've talked about this. I had a dog that I got when I was 21. I was a mm-hmm. senior in college. He was my right-hand man. Mm-hmm. I mean, everywhere I went. I took him to college parties. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a Doberman, black and tan. Mm-hmm. And he was so smart. He would sit next to me, stand next to me at the party. He may take a lap, but he'd Mm -hmm. always come back to me. I mean, I literally didn't go anywhere without this dog. Mm -hmm. Um, When he died, I, and in in the interim, by the way, I I acquired a wife, I had kids, Mm -hmm. and so he became part of a family. But when he died, I was like, there's no replacing this dog. And I cannot do it. So I waited 10 years Mm -mm. until I got another dog, which I got another Doberman, um, female, She's fawn colored. She's Ooh, very different wow. than him. She must look like Percy. She looks like a little bit like a Weimariner. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, he's she's grayish, mm-hmm. but I waited way too long, Dana. You yep. were smart to get Percy yeah. right after Jasper. Well, you know what happened was so Peter and I've been married uh, twenty six years, 
together 27 years. And in all of our time together, in all those years, we've only been without a dog about 18 weeks of that. And part of the reason is because, and now we're on our third Vishla. Um, and what happened when Jasper died, it was so shock. Or, I'm sorry, Henry died. He was my first dog. This is the dog that I had from, got him in Scotland when I was living with Peter in England. He come, I was 26 years old. He, we, go, we moved to California. He was a surfing dog. He could surf with the best of them out by in the Navy Seals Beach in Coronado. He was amazing. And he he could do everything. He knew all the names of all of his toys. He, we had this trick that I taught him. You, you know, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I could teach him anything. And George Bush used to laugh so much because I taught Henry. I'd say, hey, Henry, show us what you think about John Kerry. And we would go to his toy box and get my old flip-flop and bring it back. And we'd be like, <laughs> flip-flop, flip-flop. And we would, he was the best. When he died, it was so shocking. We had just moved to New York. We're living in an apartment in the city. There's no grass anywhere. And we're like, he was almost 14, so it's not totally unexpected. And Greta Van Susteren called me around 10.30 p.m. that night. Who calls at 10.30 p.m., right? I thought somebody else had died. And she says, hi, I know you don't want to hear this, but you have to get another one right away. I said, well, Greta, I can't because we live in an apartment and now I have this new job. And it's like, how am I going to train him? And she goes, it's the only way to heal your heart. And, and then Charles Krauthammer said, I know you think, why do we do this to ourselves? Because the grief is so painful. He says, because dogs make us better people. And so when Jasper died, we, uh, uh, one of our friends who is a breeder heard about this and called and said, I've got a litter coming. We said, we'll take the, we'll take the largest male. It's so smart. I, I did the thing where like, well, I, I did two things. I can't replace him. And so I don't mm -hmm. want to try. And then same as your story, I had moved to New York and I was like, mm -hmm. I can't get a Doberman. You love Vishlas. Mm -hmm. I love Doberman. Um, I, can't, I was like, I can't get one in New York City. But what it ended up being is 10 years of my life without a dog. And you're yeah. right. It is less of a life. I really do believe that. But you and I are huge dog people, but it's less of a life. And now that I have another one, I realize what I was missing all that time. Also, doesn't it? I'm sure you find with your family that it brings the family together. Yes. Like it's, it, even if the family's in an argument, like everybody can agree that the dog's the best. But you made a mistake. I let the first dog in the bed because <laughs> it was just me and him. She does not, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and act like a hard ass. She definitely gets in the bed. And my wife is the weak link. Mm -hmm. But the rule is. Not That's in the, the bed, role. right? Not in the yeah, bed. Yeah, Percy does not have that role at all, but he's a good dog. And and I love also one of the great things about in, in this time where um, people feel might feel estranged from their fellow American, like I find that you can always find common ground talking about your pets. Yeah, and I think common ground is important. I used to talk about that in sports. I think we have to remember people – we have to remember that we are each human beings. Yeah. And that's what's been really lost, I think, is – is I think both societally and individually, Dana, I think like we've lost some of our even complexity as human beings, like acknowledging our failings, acknowledging the limitations of our own knowledge, acknowledging when we're wrong. We're just kind of losing what it is to be a person. Yeah. Um, I want to go to part of your story that you already brought up. So we're talking about Kaylee, mm -hmm. uh, press secretary. So you, you mentioned it. You were living in England. I, I don't know your story that well, yep. but you know, I know you were born in Wyoming. Yep. You grew up in Denver. Yep. You end up working um, in politics. You worked mm -hmm. at some congressional Capital offices. Mm -hmm. and, and then you left. And then you left for England. And it, if I look at your life, it looks like it seems to me on the surface, at least, the thing that brought you back to not just America, but to Washington, D.C., was 9-11. It's true. But you got it exactly right. Yep. I met Peter on an airplane in August of 1997, moved to England in May of 1998. So a very quick romance and... Um, this, a decision to leave what I thought was like my career that I would never work again in politics or television. Um, obviously, that's not true, and thankfully. But, you know, you tell yourself these things uh, when you're making big decisions and you're young and you, your horizon ends here. When you real, And actually, your life is so much bigger than that. And I truly believe that um, the best advice I was ever given in my life was from a family friend who told me when I was wrestling, should I move to England or not, um, she said, do not give up on this chance to be loved. And it will not hurt your career. And boy, she was right. And thank goodness I listened to her. So we're living in England. Peter wants to start his own business. I want to get back to working. I didn't have a visa. And we had gotten married. So we decided we're going to live in America. 
and we could choose anywhere we wanted to live. So we chose San Diego because who wouldn't want to live there? And we moved there with literally nothing, $10,000 of borrowed money. We didn't have a car, an apartment, anything. We had a dog, puppy, Henry, and we moved to San Diego and we just tried to make a go of it there. And I was working in public relations, but I missed Washington, D.C. I wanted to work for George W. Bush. All my friends were working somewhere in the administration. And I just I was felt like a, like a square peg in a round hole in San Diego. And people in D.C. knew that I was willing to come back. I did some interviewing in August of 2001, mid-August 2001. And 9-11 happens, and I reach out to my friend at the Justice Department to say, are you all right? And she called me and said, would you be willing to come back still, even after all of this, I need another spokesperson that can join my team right away. And I started packing while we were on the phone and moved uh, two weeks later. Like, well, I should say, I think I moved like October 8th or 9th. That's what I, re I remember coming into Washington, D.C., and the leaves were starting to turn on the trees. And I never went back to that house in San Diego. Peter stayed there, got it packed up, and yeah, I, that was really the moment. And I was just working at the Justice Department as one of many spokespeople. And I was assigned the Na en Environment and Natural Resources Division, which is one of the reasons I'm really interested in energy and environment and conservation, kind of from where I grew up, but also just where I cut my teeth on policy. Before we start talking about the life of a press secretary, how do you fall in love on a plane? It was quick. And you know what? It happens more often than you think. It's unbelievable how many people have actually met on a plane. Now, this was 1997, so I had a hard copy book. I did not have AirPods. I didn't have like, I, was, I wasn't carrying around my Walkman. You know? <laughs> I didn't have anything that would distract me. And, you know, you sit down and you're like, he asked me if he could put my bag up above for me. I heard the accent. Uh, but really it was because I think on a plane, you kind of let down your guard. Like, I might not ever see this person again. So you can talk about anything. And he was funny, and I remember I asked him, what do people in Europe think about Bill Clinton? And his answer was perfect. And I said, okay, I, I remember looking out the window and saying, Lord, I know I asked you to help me find somebody, but he's much older than me. He might be an axe murderer. He <laughs> lives in England. I don't know if anything he's saying is true, but I, how, this, how could it possibly be? And then um, we had our first date. He came back to America like four weeks later. And then we were engaged two weeks after that. I mean, it was it was quick, and it has lasted. That was one hell of an answer about Bill Clinton. <laughs> Great answer on Bill Clinton, Peter. You had no idea. <laughs> How does that work at the end of the flight? He asked for your number? He, um, well, actually, we were going to trade information, and I had just been in Denver doing editorial board meetings with a congressman I worked for, and I was out of cards. This is back in the day when you had, like, the hard copy business card. So he gave me one of his that we still have to this day, and I didn't want him to think that I was flirting with him. So I made the business card look like my business card. I even included the fax number mm -hmm. and to make it look real official. Um, so, I, yeah, that's how we exchanged information. All right. Press secretary. From the outside, Dana, and I've told this to Kaylee. She's guest hosted on Fox and Friends Weekend, so I've had to have yeah, conversations. Yeah, she's such a great job. Yeah, and that's a nice time because you spend four hours together yes. with commercial breaks and you kind of get to know each other. But I've told Kaylee this. To me, from the outside, I think for a lot of us, it looks like a really fun job, a stressful job. But for me, and maybe my personality type, it looks like a fun job. You look from a You'd lot. Love it. A lot of my career. <laughs> look, I was outnumbered at CNN, mm -hmm. and and I was outnumbered at ESPN. And I used to say, like, if you want to know a debate or rhetorical trick, like when you, if you're Jessica Tarlov sitting at the table on the five, you're outnumbered somewhat. Mm -hmm. four to one. Mm -hmm. You don't have to rebut every single point. No. You can pick your favorite pick one, one right. to to rebut. You, as a press secretary, are surrounded, this is my characterization, but dozens of hostile, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> questioners. And I'm just, it looks like it would be fun. I loved that job with my entire being, mostly because I really loved and believed in the president I was working for and the purpose and the cause we were a nation at war, and we took our jobs very seriously, but we didn't take ourselves seriously. Um, I would not say that the rep most reporters in the room weren't hostile. I would say adversarial, but that was by nature. I think that's true. Um, I always believe that 50% of my job was defending and representing the president of the United States, advocating for the policies and defending our country 
and on the world stage. Um, but that, the other 50% was making sure that the press had access to the government. And I took that very seriously. That has gone away. Do you know that George, uh, that, excuse me, that Joe Biden has not given one interview in the Oval Office to any of the main media in, from the briefing room and that they don't complain about it? I cannot believe They complain about it, but they don't, they're not up in arms about it. So I thought that things were adversarial. My power in the room was, one, I had the microphone. Um, but also, I um, try always to be the most well-read person in the room, and I wanted all of them to know it. But I would also take an interest in what they were writing. So I would read everything that they wrote, and I would pay attention, and I would say, hey, Cheryl, that was a great piece this weekend that you wrote about. So, you know, had, maybe it had nothing to do with the White House. Um, I had good relationships with them, and I understood where they were coming from. I knew they had a job to do and that I had a job to do. So I never thought of it as hostile. Sometimes I would, try, I would maybe be a little oversensitive at times to criticism, but I also operated under the never let them see you sweat. There's something also that's a major, two major differences between um, when I was there and when somebody like Kaylee was there. Uh, it used to be that the briefing was started and ended with the lead wire reporter in the room, the most senior wire reporter in the room. I just accepted as tradition that you didn't, you were not let off of the podium until that senior wire reporter said, thank you, which meant, yes, like talk about a challenge. Like, okay, I'll, I'll just sit here and take these questions. But also if things got repetitive or ridiculous, the senior reporter would be like, okay, we're done here. Thank you. So that was one thing. Now you see like Corinne will like shut her binder and storm off as if it's something, you know, as if she's making a statement because she doesn't want to answer the questions anymore. But the other thing we did not have is social media. It was not a thing. When I left in on January 20th, 2009, I didn't even have a Twitter account. And all of that has changed the job tremendously. How does social media change the job? Uh, well, first of all, every reporter, you know exactly what they're saying. And a lot of, if you watch reporters, they all tweet for each other, trying to outdo one another. Not so much anymore. That's, it's, it, it, it has calmed down, I would say. But during those first years when Twitter was first taking off, you would all of a sudden, it was like, oh, the mask was off. You knew exactly where they were coming from. That changed a little bit. Um, and they were competing for eyeballs from their bosses as well. The other thing is just you know, the vitriol. Now, there was also great opportunity because... And you see President Obama, but mostly President Trump, really take advantage of this. That you don't have to wait to tell the American people at the briefing room what's on the president's mind. I'll tell you what's on the president's mind right now. And actually, President Trump said, I'll do you one better. I'll tell you what's on my mind directly. So the job of the press secretary, to me, has changed a tremendous amount. And Biden doesn't utilize th those tools, but President Trump did, just like John F. Kennedy figured out how to use television, or Ronald Reagan using television, FDR using radio. Um, Barack Obama figured out social media initially by, for the fundraising. In 2008, they had things like cat lovers for Obama. Would you give us $5 today? <laughs> That's how the small donors really started. Like, he figured that out. Trump figures out how to use social media to his benefit or detriment to talk directly to the American people. So there will, there's a next thing coming, and it might be TikTok. It might be something, I don't know, maybe not TikTok, but some version of it that's coming, that there's always a way to think ahead about the innovation. And I wish that I had thought of that beforehand. I just didn't. So you, you described your relationship with the press as adversarial but not hostile. And I don't mm -hmm. think that she'll mind me saying this. I asked Kaylee about her relationship with the press. That and was she hostile. Said, Yes, mm -hmm. and she also said that it was at arm's length. There was not going out for drinks afterwards. Mm -hmm. There was not a personal connection mm -hmm. to the press pool. Mm -hmm. um, yours sounds like you had much more of a relationship, even yep. if it were adversarial. But I am curious, not only has social media changed the game, of course, Donald Trump changes mm -hmm. the game as well, and it becomes much more hostile uh, on both sides yep. um, towards the press. But I'm curious with you now, like those same relationships who mm -hmm. may have been cordial if adversarial have now mm -hmm. exposed themselves on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You're now on Fox. Mm -hmm. What are those relationships like I for said, you now? I don't talk to that many of them anymore, but I'm still very friendly with them. Like Kelly O'Donnell of NBC News will always be fond of her. What's actually pretty interesting is John Roberts, who anchors our 
one to three. He was at CBS when I was at the White House, CBS and then CNN. Um, Brett Baer was at Fox. Obviously, we're a lot of people I'm now colleagues with. Kevin Cork was at NBC. Um, a lot of people have moved around, right? So I'm now working with many people who were in um, the briefing room at the time. Several of them have left the job. Many of them have retired. I mean, we're getting, it was 2008 when I left. So, and I, and you think about it, I was in the White House from 2002 at some point, at some level, 2002 through 2008. That's a long time. I mean, careers have changed. There's different personalities now in the briefing room. Some have even passed away, um, like Bill Plant, for example, of CBS News. So we're still friendly. I, you talk about um, an arm's length. One of the things we used to do on foreign trips, I mean, we went a lot of places, Chief of Staff Josh Bolton, he would host the reporters for bowling. We went bowling in Peru, Romania, Moscow. A few other places are coming to mind. Like, that was our thing. Like, we, we, we took the reporters bowling. It was all off the record, and it was fun, friendly, and you get to know people a little bit more as to, like, their kids might love softball or like whatever it is. You have a little bit of that human connection that we're talking about beforehand. And that really helped, especially on days that were tough. So I want to ask you this. I think this ties into your experience, not just as press secretary, but you have a wealth of experience in Washington, D.C. that mm -hmm. someone like I would not have. And I think that you can help inform me, for example, on things that from the outside just remain so mysterious. So what, what I'm talking about is a lot that took place over the past week. So mm -hmm. in Congress, um, at least two different bills have passed through the House that it would appear on the surface that is out of touch with the Republican voter base. That's the FISA renewal and mm -hmm. the, um, the funding for Ukraine. Now, I look at that and I go, all right, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, is a guy that for many people would be thinking, that's a surprise. It's not who we thought Mike Johnson was necessarily before he became speaker. And I think a lot of people on the right dismiss it as you've been, you've been co-opted by the establishment or you've become the regime or you've now become Washington, D.C. And it's easy to villainize everybody that disagrees with you. For me, I sit there and I go, well, what am I missing? Mm -hmm. Right. So I sit there and I, I still don't understand, Dana. I, I have trouble to this day understanding the importance of to America of Ukraine. But clearly something with Mike Johnson and a great huge chunk of the Republican congressional mm -hmm. offices feel differently than me. So mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have access, you have experience in that world and I don't wanna be somebody that just dismisses it as, and I'm not saying it, it shouldn't be dismissed, but I don't wanna just dismiss it as, well, you're now Washington no. DC. So. Yeah. What do you think? Like, well, as for the, we could use those two bills as an example, but what do you think goes on and explains? And by the way, the base may not be out of touch. I mean, some of the base is, but polling on Ukraine is pretty, I don't know what it is today. It's like 60% support. 60% support. Yeah. So what is, is that what's going on, a calculation think, of polling? I'm not sure. I do think things get distorted by a few people who are very loud. And I think that Mike Johnson, I'm going to take him at his word. He said, I listened to the briefings that, he was giving the classified briefings and he was convinced that this is an important thing to do and the right thing to do and the right thing for our own national security and our future. This is the right thing to do. He said he prayed about it and he figured out a way to get it through. Now he's dealing with the, I've never seen congressional majorities this small. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, but I, I don't think that there was this really robust conversation on the Ukraine side, that's on the Ukraine side. On the FISA thing, on the FISA renewal, I did FISA renewal in 2007, 2008, and we, it was the same arguments back then. And it's been abused, and it's been modified, and then you have people that are on the intel committees and listening, like Republicans who are saying, we're listening to these briefings, we believe that this is in our national security interest, and this is why we think we want to vote this way. Part of the thing with the media is that everything is so distorted, like how much information people can get. And it's like uh, I was talking this weekend about how, uh, you know, when you're, on, when you're looking at a highway where the speed limit is 75, so people are going 85 and the, the cars are moving this fast. That's how fast some of these conversations are going. Mm. And the, the other day I interviewed a senator who I asked about FISA renewal. He said one of his big problems with it was about big tech being able to sell our information. And I said, 
Is that in the 702 segment, the one you're, the section that you're complaining about that you don't like? He says, absolutely it is. I said, oh, okay. I mean, I've, I've not done it for a while, so I don't know. Well, two hours later, I found out, oh, I was right. I, so I'm like, even the senator and I are both like pretty educated people on this issue, and we're not quite nailing down the facts of it all. So I think people are not going to Washington like maybe they used to, but maybe they should. What do you mean by One that? One of the things is that they don't know each other. Like I was just saying, like in the uh, off the record bowling right. excursions that we would do once in a while that just made looking at each other a little bit more as humans, as also people we have to work with. So back in the day, like when Harold Ford Jr. was a child and his father was um, a congressman, that was when there wasn't that types of communications that we have now. You moved your family to Washington, D.C. so that you could be there and do your job. And your kids went to school there and you bought a house there and then you would go home for congressional recess. You didn't fly in on a Tuesday morning and leave first thing on a Thursday night. You actually were there. You got Everybody got to know each other. You would have dinners together. Um, Harold Ford Jr., he might make a friend at school with somebody that you disagreed with vehemently on politics, but the kids are friends. And so, you know what? You end up having a beer in the backyard with your opponent and you had that kind of interaction. And I do think that for all of us, it's why I'm not for working from home for, for people in the workplace, not, not just in politics. It's that human connection is critical for our own well-being and work relationships make getting to a result better. Yes, but I'm a little torn on that. I, I understand how that increases collegiality, mm -hmm. but I guess my concern would be I don't want you, Congressman, connected to – I'm from Texas. I don't mm -hmm. want you, Texas Congressional District Congressman, to be connected to your either Democrat or Republican congressional colleague from Wisconsin. I want you to be connected to your district. Mm -hmm. And so go home and connect with your district, and you may accomplish some collegiality, but I think there's a concern for many people, but it increasingly just makes you more removed from the American people. And I guess that's that's what I've kind of – like in a way, that's what I'm asking you. Like because you have that exposure, and I own my humility this, I do not have this exposure of having been in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and been inside these institutions. And I am concerned. I do share many of the concerns that it's increasingly removed from America. And like you, you bring up Mike John saying, I saw the intel briefing. Mm -hmm. Well, I respect that. I also mm -hmm. worry that the institutions behind the intelligence sure, communities, mm -hmm. yeah, can I trust them to mm -hmm. not pursue their own self-interest and co-opt congressmen who are now increasingly removed from the American voter base? Mm -hmm. Well, Harold Ford and I gave a speech together the other day, and he, looked, he and I looked at each other as we were giving our answers, and on stage in front of everybody, I said, do we sound really old? Because what we're talking about no longer happens, and I don't think there's any going back. I think the, the horse has left the barn. Like nobody is going like what you're saying is that they're they they don't want to hang out with their congressional member from Wisconsin. But even that I'm but, what I'm wrestling but, with is is it good to is it good Well, is or it good bad? now? Would it be good for them to I mean to? Is, I mean I, I mean uh, do, are, are, do what we have now is it good? Well, so there's two sides to that. Um I'll give you my perspective on both sides. One, and it's we just talked about this last week here on the Will Cain show. Justice Scalia gave this this talk before Congress where he talked about what makes the United States exceptional. Mm -hmm. And he said it's 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 not the Constitution. Um, he said, you know, there are many different countries who've drafted wonderful constitutions, but you could have parchment guarantees. Like just because you put the promises on paper doesn't mean it's how it manifests in life. He said what makes America special is its checks and balances, its bifurcated government, it's the three branches of government, all designed to create gridlock. He said, you, American people need to learn to love gridlock because gridlock is the preservation of freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, good laws impose upon freedom. So I, I think in that way, it can be good now. Yeah. I think the flip side of that that I'm saying is a problem is I do think it's a problem if congressmen think their job is simply to preen to the public. And I think there is a lot. And I've, I've talked up the virtues of populism, not across the board, but – Populism is like an ingredient in a recipe. You need to be careful exactly how much you put into the recipe. A dash. Um, but I, don't, I do think we have gotten to a place today where congressmen are performing. Oh, yeah. 
But, you know, another thing is, like, this, let's go back to the briefing room for a second. Mike McCurry was the press secretary for Bill Clinton in 1997. I don't know. I don't know which ranges he was, but definitely I know is 1997, and he made a decision that changed a lot of things for everybody. As did C-SPAN around the same time. What did they do? He allowed cameras into the White House briefing room for the first time ever. And what did all of a sudden did you have? Performance. Okay. What do you have on C-SPAN? Performance. Cable news. It's performance. And I'm not, that's why I'm saying I'm like I don't know if that's necessarily better. I like gridlock. Oh, I love I love it when they're recess, Congress and recess. That means they're not raising my taxes or, or putting more regulation. But the problem is Biden's doing all the regulation, so now we're relying on the judicial branch in order to backstop all of that. And thank goodness, to, from from my perspective, that that's happening. But that what has that done? That also means that on the opposite side, if you don't like what the, some of the Supreme Court decisions, then you think that that institution's broken, and so. They might trust the intel community, but they don't trust the Supreme Court. So I don't know if any of that's good. But the funny thing about Mike McCurry is the very day he let cameras into the courtroom, excuse me, and cameras into the briefing room, was the day that the Monica Lewinsky story broke. Oh, really? What a and day. And he said, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to uh, ask you one last thing, because I've always been fascinated by this part of your story. And you and I have talked off and on a little bit about this. But... You've got to tell me just a little bit more about Wyoming. You've got okay. to tell me about the family, yeah. the family ranch. You oh, grew happy up. To. You grew up. You're basically um, Beth from Yellowstone. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm not that badass uh, at all. I'm trying to think if there's another character in there in that story, but no, probably not. Um, my great grandparents came from Italy uh, separately. My grand, my great grandfather came to be a coal miner in Weston County, so that's the Black Hills of Wyoming, so about 80 miles west of Mount Rushmore. And there was um, a coal miner, coal mine called the Cambria uh, plant. I think it might still be there, actually. And a lot of Italians came over, and they took advantage of the Homestead Act. This is the late 1800s. And the Homestead Act said you can get 60 acres as long as you promise to farm it for five years, and you had to build a structure. It had to have two rooms and four walls, and you had to build a well. So my grandfather would work the five and a half days, and on Saturday afternoon, he would walk the 18 miles, and he would hand dig, hunt, hand dig the well, come back, and he met my great-grandmother at the boarding house. My great-grandmother's sister ran the boarding house. They meet there. They fall in love. They have nine children. Uh, one died uh, as a child. One of them was my grandfather that lived, and uh, he was going to be a doctor. And school was about 22 miles from where they were, so they would go to school. It was like a lot, right? This was really uphill both ways. Um, and then he went to the war in World War II and thought that he was going to become a doctor and see the world. Uh, came back from World War II and decided after being in, uh, on, in the Pacific, he'd seen the world, enough of it, and the ranch really needed him to come back. On that night that he's uh, going to arrive back in America, they're going to dock in Philadelphia. His friends say, we're going to set you up on a blind date. He says, absolutely not, not going. My, gra my grandmother, they said, we're going to set you up on this blind date. She says, absolutely not. I'm not going. They go on the blind date, and two months later, kind of like my story in a way, they, she moved to Wyoming. Uh, two months later, takes the train across, and my dad was the oldest of their three boys, and uh, my grandfather grew it to a 50,000-acre ranch, and um, he passed away right uh, two months after 9-11, the day after Thanksgiving, moving cattle, massive heart attack. And my uncle, Matt, runs the ranch now with uh, his two sons, Wade and Preston, and their children. And it's a beautiful, wonderful place that my uncle says, don't tell anybody how nice it is. <laughs> they don't want anybody else coming. What I've been there, not to your ranch, that corner mm -hmm. of Wyoming. What's the famous Devil's? Devil's Tower. I've so it's about 80 miles, 50 miles south of Devil's Tower and 80 miles west of Mount Rushmore. So I, went, I grew up going to see the faces. You know, that was our big trip. Yeah. Gonna go see the faces every year in Mount Rushmore. I am so jealous. It was a beautiful childhood, um, and uh, I'll always be grateful that I had that opportunity. And I care very much for rural America. And I try. I'm, I'm glad that Fox pays attention. We don't pay enough attention, but we pay more attention than anybody else. I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. Being I love the segment that you and Pete do about outside, off of, the grid, uh, off the grid. I love that segment. Thank that's you. a great one. 
yeah, we need to be in touch, not just with New York and Washington, D.C., we need to be in touch with America. And lucky, he and I are lucky enough that he lives in Nashville, and I still get to live in, in Dallas. Texas. But I would prefer to live on a 50,000-acre ranch <laughs> in Texas. One day, you will. <laughs> All right, Dana Perino, thank you so thank much you. Thank for you. hanging out with us today on The Will King Thanks Show. So much.